Um, thanks for having me. Uh, <laughs> could I um, ask for a favor? Simon or someone else, could I maybe get some water here? Okay. Sorry, if I break out in a wild cough, I've been traveling the last 10 days through Kenya and up to Libya, um, and it left me with a bit of a cough. Other than that, I'm fine. But um, <clears throat> Okay. So um, I wasn't quite expecting to, uh, to do the keynote, a closing keynote. I, this idea for this talk sort of came up in, um, while sitting frustrated in traffic and just being uh, generally grumpy about how, uh, how developers or how we are often spending our time. And just, I guess more grumpiness was about big, big problems in the world that don't seem to get the attention they need. So I, I called this talk uh, Hack Where It Matters. And then uh, um, some bunch of crazy flights were scheduled for me. And um, I arrived yesterday morning and now I'm here doing the keynote. So if, if things are <laughs> not completely coherent, excuse me, please do come talk to me afterwards so I can explain it properly. Um, so before I, uh, okay, so at, at Prekelt, we, I sometimes, well, we sometimes uh, are told that the, the engineers and the devs do the, do the mushiest talks, um, which might be a little bit strange, but you were warned this might be one of them. Um, so I'd like to start with a little story about a, uh, about a city. Does anyone read Arabic here? No one? Awesome. One. one. All right, what does it say? Kahira, yeah. That's, so I'll tell you what the city exactly is, but it, it means the conquerors. Another name for it is Umm al Dunya, which is a fairly proud name, which means, well, Cape Town has a similar name, but it, it basically means mother of the world. So the story is also about Zabal, which is trash, and Zabalin, which means the people of the trash, the people who, who clean up the trash. So the city is, uh, is Cairo in Egypt. It's, uh, it's got nine million people. And um, the people of the trash live in an area called Muqattam. Um, this is a neighborhood outside of, I need to put this down somewhere. <coughs> this is a neighborhood outside of, uh, outside of Cairo where all these uh, trash collectors live. And there's 60,000 trash collectors who live there. Now, um, these people, at one point, and I'll tell more in the story a bit, they, um, they obviously collect Cairo's trash and, uh, and, and process it. And the main, how they do this is, is because they, they employ pigs. Um, the pigs eat all the organic waste, and um, the rest of it is, is, is left for recycling or reuse provides income for these people. Uh, the pigs obviously provide a, a source of income as well as food. And there's all sorts of really interesting um, micro businesses that um, have come up out of this community and, and the work they do in, in, in Cairo. Um, so again, just remember, it's nine, nine million people in Cairo, 60,000, well, between 50 and 70,000 uh, trash collectors. And these are all people who do this work uh, manually. They go around house to house, collecting the trash, sorting it, and they have a whole little ecosystem built up around um, processing this stuff. Now, a couple of years ago, there was the, uh, the bird flu scare. And um, parliament, Egyptian parliament, uh, decided that, well, it, it might have been the bird flu scare, but they were, for some reason, they thought it was also swine flu. And they killed all of the, the pigs of the, the Zabalin, of the trash people. Um, and this had quite a huge impact, um, other than well, destruction of value for these people. Um, obviously, the, the whole trash collection system was completely broken. So the Egyptian government uh, issued contracts to foreign companies and mandated that 20% of all trash collected should be recycled and 80% was allowed to go into landfills. Now, the Zabelin, the trash people, they managed to recycle 80% of trash. Um, they did this because 
pigs consumed a lot of the organic waste, and like I said, a lot of stuff um, was recycled, repurposed into other businesses. New materials were being made out of it and sort of stimulated this whole little economy. Um, but these foreign fir firms were only that moved in after the pigs were killed, um, were only able to, or only had to uh, uh, re recycle 20%. So the end result was that, on just for the people living in the city, is it, the people, well, the inhabitants of Cairo now had to pay money for trash collection. It wasn't collected anymore from their doors. They had to walk to some collection points. Um, it was, as a result, it was a lot more, a uh, lot less accessible, sorry, and a lot more trash was left in the city. And the whole system that came in place of the Zabelin and their pigs um, was more expensive and generally a worse solution. Now, because um, because of all, well, because of the change in, the, in how this, this ecosystem worked, as a result, there was rotting trash in Cairo. Because of that, there, was, uh, there were more infectious diseases, uh, fairly big rat infestation. And the people who were living in Cairo at the time said the city smelled incredibly bad. Um, so if we're looking at the numbers, I said earlier, it was 9 million to 60,000 trash collectors. 9 million inhabitants, 60,000. So that's one trash collector for 150,000 inha oh, sorry, 150 inhabitants in Cairo. So that's a that's a massive impact uh, these people had, even though no one was really paying attention. Um, so when these people were stopped from doing their work, this um, the city that was called the Conqueror and the Mother of the World uh, was pretty much brought to a stinking halt in, in surprisingly little time. So I, I find this impact su super interesting that because the government stepped in of a scare, um, which curiously didn't come from the Ministry of Health or anything, it was Parliament straight away that decided this, uh, and they, they killed all the pigs, they destroyed massive property for, for these people because they got significantly less money for these pigs than they would have had if they paid them, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the end result was a huge impact. Well, in this case, a negative impact, but a, a relatively tiny fraction of the population, 150th, uh, had a huge impact on this city. So <coughs> just thinking about software, I'd like to approach this from the other side. So um, in terms of impact from the perspective of the, well, turn, look at it from the other side, from the perspective of the Zabelin and the pigs. So no one really realized how important and efficient they were until their system was broken. Um, no one complained about the trash system or actually thought about getting, um, um, foreign companies to get involved uh, while everything was working. It was only when the pigs were killed that they needed a different system. And the system that came into place was um, significantly more expensive, worked significantly worse. Um, so, but coming from, from the software perspective, I think, I believe we can design and build sys these kinds of systems that have this kind of impact. Not the, ne not the negative impact. I'm sure we can build those as well. We don't want to. Uh, well, we should not want to. Um, but I think we can build these, these types of systems that have this massive impact on populations. So within the company, we're starting to call these ideas moonshots. Um, I heard Gustav mention this one a while back for the first time. I, I quite enjoyed the word. And um, thanks. So the word moonshot comes from, um, comes from obviously NASA putting a, a man on the moon. And as a result um, of, of that technical undertaking, a whole host of new innovations were, uh, were made possible because all of a sudden, man had put another dude on the moon. Um, so in a way, moonshots are, are new ideas that push new boundaries, that make new things possible. So I'll be coming back to this later. Um, but just, again, looking at numbers, this is, I think, an older figure, uh, but at the moment there are 1.7 billion people living in desperate poverty. That's a, a huge number. I tried to put it in zeros, but then I, yeah, I thought this represented it better, but there's a lot of zeros. And there are 10 million super rich. I don't know, quite know what the level is of super rich, but um, I can get the sources for you after this. But anyway, so there are 10 million super rich. That's a ratio of that is, is 
quite similar to the Zebulin and Cairo. So the ratio of that is one super rich to 170 people living in desperate poverty. So to alleviate the poverty problem in a way, you could say that it takes um, for every super rich person to take 170 people out of desperate poverty in their lifetime would solve the poverty problem, just purely on a numbers figure. Um, so again, coming to the, the story of the Zabelin, why I like it is that it, it, it's the solution they had around trash collection was that it was, a, was local knowledge and a very, very simple solution that was a win-win on each side. These people had a source of income, had a source of animal protein, had, had, a, had an ecosystem of micro-businesses that were uh, growing around trash collection, and they had a huge impact. Um, so in a way, the interesting thing was, well, what I find especially interesting is that the external Western companies couldn't or maybe wouldn't match their level of service. Uh, they were more expensive, poor service delivery in, in every single aspect. Um, so now it comes to Python. And just, just out of curiosity, who here does not write Python on a daily basis? Well, like work daily basis. All right, that's cool. Um, so regardless of language, I think the best program ever written is has zero lines of code. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty easy. Basically, if you don't wanna write software with bugs, don't write software. Um, that's pretty much what it boils down to. Uh, it is, the, so obviously if this was true, we wouldn't ever write any software. So, but I think the point is the ability to write readable programs in, in least amount of code is, is, a, is a huge win. And, uh, and for me, Python allows, allows me to do that. Um, so there's been studies um, for, I believe it's Coverity, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Coverity Report, they do static analysis on, 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 on code bases, open source and, and closed source. So it turns out that for projects with less than a million lines of code, um, and who, who's, who's ever written, like who's worked on a project with more than a million lines of code? I'm seeing one hand. Okay, those are massive, massive projects. Um, some was generated. Like, okay. Okay. Who was written on non-generated million lines of code? Because I can write, a, I can generate million lines of code as well. Okay. All right, so um, the Coverity uh, Report did analysis on open source projects. And um, they found, based on their <coughs> algorithms, I'm not quite sure how all that stuff works, but uh, they found 0.69 defects per thousand single lines of code for open source software. So for less than a million lines of code, um, based on their analysis, open source software is of higher quality than closed source. It seems to be there it seems to be a threshold for a million lines of code after which um, closed source gets a little bit better, um, probably because they have more money and finances or something. I don't really want to get into these types of details or discussions, but this is what the report says. Now what I found especially interesting was that for Python, so this is for all open source uh, lines of code. Anyone want to guess what it was for Python? If you already know, don't spoil it. <laughs> guess? 0 0.4. Close. <laughs> so for Python, that's uh, 0.005. Sorry? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I need to read up on how their, how their stuff works. But they say, um, according to their report, Python sets a new level of quality for open source software. Um, so congratulations on choosing an excellent language. Um, but I, I think this is, this is pretty key. If you want to have impact, on uh, like a big massive impact with little amount of code as possible, choose a tool that allows you to express code in such a way that your ideas actually <laughs> develop into a program with um, as little ambiguity as possible and obviously as little 
but less lines of code, less bugs, hopefully. Um, and Python is a great tool to, to do that with. So some of the stuff that we've been, um, we've been developing and um, that, that hopefully will have this kind of impact um, are, are started out very, very small. So one of them is, is Wikipedia Zero, which we'll be launching in, in Kenya with, with Airtel next week. Um, and it allows you to query and, well, search Wikipedia content um, over USSD um, and receive the results via SMS. Um, this number actually works here in South Africa, so if any one of you dials star 128.864 hash, it should ask you, or set, tell you, like, welcome to Wikipedia, <laughs> free information service, what do you want to search for? So you can type in anything, PyCon, and, s and you get results back. Sorry, you have a question? Okay, I'll, I'll take that question for later. Hold on to it. All right. Um, so you basically you query Wikipedia, and you dig into the content, and you get sections. You receive the content of the section via SMS. And uh, to that SMS, you can reply with more. And there's a bunch of SMSs that are stitched together um, that um, provide access to that Wikipedia article. So this started out as a as a hack over lunch, um, well, Jeremy, you, you just joined us, I think, at the time. We were in Joburg together, and it was like, hey, what can we do with this thing that we've built? I wonder if we can access Wikipedia. And I started experimenting with it over Gtalk. I, I looked it up in our, uh, in our uh, code repository, and th the initial hack of it was 102 lines of code to get that up and running. Now it's being launched as a production service. It's no longer 102 lines of code. Don't worry, that was a proof of concept. But uh, it just shows you how, like, how much you can actually do with very little lines of code that grows into something that could potentially be, could have a massive impact. So um, this is launching with Wikipedia, or sorry, with Airtel in Kenya. Uh, Airtel is subsidizing the um, USSD and SMS. So anyone with a phone in Kenya that has an Airtel SIM can now access Wikipedia for free, even if it's like a 10 or 15 year old monochrome Nokia. This started out as 102 lines of Python code that I hacked together over lunch. Um, it, it doesn't take a lot of lines of code to actually have something that potentially grows into something super useful. Yeah, okay, so Jeremy, who wrote the main thing after I hacked the thing together, said it's 1,200 lines of code now, now? Yeah. and half of that is tests. Um, the other one that I, I find exceptionally useful, also started out as a, as a bit of a hack, is Google Maps directions over USSD. Um, a couple of months ago, I decided that I wanted to have a, a cheaper phone, basically a dumb phone, and I, I got a Nokia Asha. Um, the only thing cool about it is that it has an FM radio and um, it does WhatsApp. And, and that's pretty much it. It's terribly slow. Browsing is painful. Um, but I decided I wanted to get it because A, I spent too much time staring at my phone doing nothing useful. And B, I wanted to have a phone that was a little bit more like the types of phone that our target audience would use. Now, um, turns out that that phone doesn't have any GPS and getting directions over Google Maps and Opera Mini is very, very painful. Um, so this application that I wrote is 266 lines of code and feel free to try it. It works in South Africa. It asks you where you are, where do you want to go. Um, based on the, the address that you type in, it'll hit Google's APIs and, and get um, a list of matches that point to GPS and then point A, point B directions and then feed that to another API that tells you, okay, between these two, you have these waypoints turn by turn, turn that into an SMS and send that to the phone. Um, I, I've got this bookmarked on, well, I've got it as a permanent address book entry on my phone because when I get lost in Cape Town, it's, it's really quite useful. Um, again, this is 266 lines of code to get this running. So I'm starting to see this pattern um, of simple, simple applications. And obviously you could argue that, yes, this builds on this platform called Vimy that we've been building for two years that is a couple of tens of thousands of code 
lines of code. But then if you start ar th that argument, then you know the whole internet is uh, it's more of that. It's just in terms of effort that it required me to get this going was, was 266 lines of code. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this challenge to, to think about apps that have a massive impact. Um, I think the challenge for me is to write apps that are less than 300 lines of code. Um, I think that's a nice space because either it's a success or it's a failure. It doesn't leave a lot of room for mediocrity. Um, so trying to feature bloat 300 lines of code, it's pretty hard. Okay, Python makes it more easy than other languages, but I, I think that's a good challenge. Like what can we build with 300 lines of code? What can we build over lunch that potentially that we could deploy and see what it does? What impact does it have? Just coming back to the story of those pigs, no one thought, well, people were warned, but they still killed the pigs and the city smelled. And it was a huge impact. If we turn that around, what little thing can we do to have a massive impact on a, on a national, on a continental just scale? What can we do? I think w given our skills together of all these people in the room here, there's a, there's a shitload we can do. Um, I think it, we need to step up to that challenge. So some of the challenges that I've been entertaining is this is, I, I, I hate this site. <laughs> so this is the Golden Arrows bus service in Cape Town. They are very proud that they exist over 150 years. Um, they, okay, to, to their credit, they do publish their timetables online, but this site is built out of frames They're, and only works properly on a desktop computer. Now, in terms of target audience who has a desktop computer, well, you guys all have a desktop computer, right? I'm assuming, or a laptop, something that displays a web page normally. How many of you sit on a Golden Arrows bus on like, well, it's September now, October. In this last year, how many of you have sat on a Golden Arrows bus? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So that's less than, I don't know, 2%? Clearly, we are not the target audience of Golden Arrows bus services. However, they have written a site that makes timetables available to us. It's like, thank you, but that's useless. <laughs> um, like the people who sit on this bus don't have access to this information. I, I've spent time in communities where people struggle to find a job. And then when they do find a job opportunity, they struggle to be on time because they don't have access to bus schedules on how to get places. And there's, for their job, there's 50 other people trying to get that job. And just because they didn't know the schedule, they were late, they missed a job opportunity, and they spent valuable money on, on, um, on transportation trying to get there. Now, all this data is locked up in this site. Now, I'm sure all of you are thinking right now, wait, we can scrape that. Exactly, we can, but no one's doing it. Um, there's, a, there's a tool called Scraper Wiki. Has anyone used this stuff? No? I know Milton. Yay, Milton. Milton actually introduced me to it. This is awesome, because you can log in, write a little bit of Python code, they provide modules for you to, for, to scrape your scrape websites. It'll stick it into a SQLite database for you and then provides a web service that exports all of the data that's stored in that SQLite database as JSON. So you can just, you end up with a URL that you can query and get data back. So all of a sudden, combining this horrible site, especially that, that little thing in the middle is an iframe. Like, who in their right mind develops stuff like this? But anyway. That stuff in the middle is an iframe we can scrape with this stuff and completely free. And you can schedule it so that it happens on a daily basis. And then you have a database, so automatically this thing turns that into a REST API that you can query. Combine that with stuff that, the stuff that we use to build Wikipedia. Um, you can expose that information over, over USSD. So then what if you start combining Google Maps, which allows for directions also for walking. So basically, like, what is your address? And then point them to the nearest bus station. Calculate how long that takes. At the bus station, where do you, I'll take your questions later. At the bus station, where do you want to go? And then calculate how long that takes. And then from there, what's the address you need to go to? So there's all this data available and APIs that we can combine, I think, in less than 300 lines of code. I, I think that should be possible um, to all of a sudden expose this information to people who are actually sitting on and using Golden Arrows bus services to get to places. 
um, and make that information accessible to them and remotely useful. Because at the moment, I think this site is, yeah, never mind, stupid. Um, next one that I think is a massive opportunity is, um, is this picture. This is kind of haunting for me. This is a picture of a, of a boy in Syria. So there was a report on Syrian refugees and what valuable things that they take with them uh, when they manage to escape. Um, this boy only managed to take his phone with him. What can we build as services for, for people like this? Um, the area that close to where I live, Masikumulele, a couple of years ago, I, there was a massive fire. Every, people lost absolutely everything. They don't, have, they don't have banks. They don't have a safety deposit box. All the valuables they have, they carry on them or store under a mattress. Uh, and I'm not intending this as a sob story or something, but this is just the reality of a lot of people that aren't us. Um, my idea is like, how hard would it be to build a USSD menu where people can just upload little bits of information that is important to them, that helps identify them in a, in a like crisis situation like Syria? Um, patient IDs for medical services, uh, registration IDs, passport numbers. What if we can capture that information on a phone and store it outside of their, their immediate territory, much like Dropbox does for us? I mean, I have a lot of like important stuff for me. I automatically stick in Dropbox because then I know if my laptop gets stolen, I still have it. If I'm traveling, I can still access that information. Um, we have the luxury. A lot of people don't. But I, we also, I think, have some responsibility in thinking around services that we can deliver for people like this in super crisis situations that actually um, help them. So coming back to the idea of, of moonshot, of some crazy big idea that seems impossible, um, but pushes boundaries and, and allows for new innovation to happen and um, allows for, for new ideas to actually rise to the service and things that were previously impossible now start becoming impossible. I'm keen to hear you guys' ideas. What is possible? Um, I hate hashtags, but in this case, I'm, I'm quite keen for you guys to go on on Twitter and Twitter PyCon's at a, like, hash moonshot what your idea is. If it doesn't fit in 140 characters, well, maybe it should, or just point, <laughs> point it somewhere else. But I'm keen, let's, let's start um, having this conversation. What can we do with 300 lines of code that has a massive impact? What crazy ideas can we come up with that has a, has a profound impact on people's lives for the better? Um, we have the tools, we have the knowledge, we have places like this where we can share ideas and, and get inspired and um, talk about problems from different unexpected angles and where I think super creative solutions come to the surface. Um, Let's have those conversations. Let's see what we can do. So I think the, the invitation from, from me personally, uh, but also for, from, from us as, as Prekelt, we want to be pushing these boundaries. We want to think, what can we do? What can we do in, in situations like Syria, where um, maybe mobile towers, phone towers are shot to pieces? Then what can we do? What can we do in other situations, or maybe Maybe in South Africa, what, like accessing the bus schedule so someone can actually be on time somewhere. Um, let's start having this conversation. This is an invitation from us. If you, um, if you have ideas, let's chat. We, we, have, we have infrastructure and things we can do um, to, to start pushing these boundaries and, and see what we, uh, what we together can come up with. We have existing projects that we need people for to, 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 to help us push boundaries. Um, as an organization, Prekelt isn't all that big, but we're very keen to collaborate with people and see, see where we can go. So this is the invitation. This is why I called my talk Hack Where It Matters, because I think these things are important. Um, there are a ton of people already inventing photo sharing sites or social networks or things you can like and whatnot, and those, those things are important as well. Um, or infrastructure that allow us to do things um, and th those are all, all important. I'm not, I'm not diminishing or, or saying those things, we shouldn't be doing them. But I, I do, s what I am saying is that we should also be focusing on these small little tools that, that provide significant value for, for people that really need it most. 
Um, so let's step up to that challenge, and I'm looking forward to hearing your moonshots. Thank you. Make sure there are five questions, otherwise this is going to get really awkward. <laughs> you had your hand up during the I was talking. Yes. Okay. So you sound like someone who knows code and writes code. OK. My code's up on GitHub. Fork it. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, I'm, I'm dead serious. Please. Okay. If that is an option, definitely. Your second question? I think that's a brilliant idea. I think you should pair up with Milton, the guy in the red shirt right there, who develops Umeli, who does similar stuff. I'm happy to give you uh, an account that uh, gives you access to USSD and SMS and knock yourself out. Uh, is this thing going to beep if I walk over there and hand out a shirt? No, it's fine. Cool. Thanks. Two quick questions. Well, one like this USCCD idea is great. Uh, I thought it would be great if I just saw both of your names once across the field and thought seeing lots of water gushing would be great if I could report it to the municipality easily. But have you thought of uh, some kind of index service so that, I mean, the average person is probably not going to know that these USSD services exist um, and it would be great to have some kind of indexing service so that, you know, you may not know that something exists, but you need to, you can look it doesn't exist yet, so write it. <laughs> Other questions? Have eight? Yes. My editor complains and goes all red. Sorry? As far as I know, no. Yes. I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're starting to see the problem. Okay. No. That. So there, there isn't. There isn't an answer for that. There's a lot of big problems that need to be solved. The biggest one is how do we provide access to information to begin with. I think USSD is a really good starting point, and we'll see from there. Um, that's my best answer for right now. Um, I'm providing tools and infrastructure. 
us, we break out foundation and the team are providing tools and infrastructure to hopefully make the barrier to entry to that significantly lower so that we can start experimenting in the 300 lines of code space and make this happen. It depends per country. A lot of countries don't have existing infrastructure to bill for, oh, that's a good question. Uh, oh sorry, I'm keen to get rid of the shirts. Um, so a lot of countries don't have existing infrastructure to bill for USSD. Um, so it happens to be free. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's, there's no reason that that won't be turned free. Uh, we try and work together with mobile network operators as much as possible, because we think these, uh, these services that provide access to information, like Wikipedia, should be free. It, sh it should be a value-added service that's important to society that these things are accessible. Um, so we try and work as best as we can with mobile network operators um, to, to try and, um, well, make this information accessible. Uh, we, we drive for free. Sometimes, I mean, operators also need to make money. Um, sometimes that's not possible, but then there's other ways of, of working around that. Um, here in South Africa, if any one of you works at an MNO or knows MNOs or have uncles in MNOs, it would be really great if there was a zero rated USSD service possible in South Africa. At the moment, that's not possible. At the moment, the only zero rated USSD service is the star 130 range. And I think there's legislation that says that that's only allowed, that numbers are only allowed to use the star 130 range for uh, airtime top-up services. So when you don't have airtime, you still need to be able to dial this number, stuff like that. Um, it would be fantastic if, at the moment, no, um, it's not free, but we can do things like if someone dials into a service, see how long and how many things back and forth it was, and then automatically top them up. Um, and just reimburse, so they need some airtime on their phone. Um, so there, there's things like that that's possible. Oh, are there more questions? Yes, I, I, yeah. I don't like bad news about the Python quality thing. I actually saw the Python interpreter. Is it available? I don't know if it's perfectly compiled there in this, but it's all pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, one more question back there. Yeah? Uh, cap and green shirt. Um, um, does USSD provide any sort of um, sessions or any session based um, <laughs> things like that as well? Um, hopefully. hopefully. Yes, maybe. Um, so, so USSD is completely session based. Watch out, guys in between. So USSD is completely session-based, as in it has a start of a session and end of a session. Um, whether the networks choose to notify you of this depends on how horrible their protocol is. Uh, luckily, in Vumi, we've abstracted most of those problems away, uh, but those are still problems for us. So USSD, in terms of session length, generally is a maximum of three minutes uh, for all sessions, like all interactions back and forth, and individual timeout on a screen is 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. You get unique identifiers, and and well, if you're USSD in general, you have a unique identifier per user that you can use. Um, inside Vumi, which is the stuff that we use, we provide um, stuff to store session state and, and things like that, and store information. Yeah, I, I wasn't pointing at you, Mike. Okay.
So, um, okay, so, right, yeah. So, Vumi solves this problem um, and provides APIs that a give you access to USSD. So, either you can do that at the moment uh, with Python and host the code yourself, or uh, we can host the code for you. At the moment, that means so you need to. Speed. Yes, yeah. So then there's an option of us hosting the code for you. Um, at, at the moment, we, via that interface, we don't allow Python yet. Um, but you'll need to write JavaScript, sorry. Um, but you can host uh, code externally, um, and that interacts with Vumi's APIs. And, uh, well, if it becomes a massive success, then obviously we want to talk to you and see, hey, Let's find some way of making this work. I'd rather it become a massive success, and then we figure out how to make this work. Yeah. Um, all right, Mike. Thank you. Um, if I'm with my critical hat on, none of these things sound like moonshots. They sound like rocks um, that together may turn into a moonshot, but are rocks really? What are, cool. you, what are you talk, What are you thinking about in terms of? Moonshots, because moonshots seem to me like Vumi is a moonshot, not a little app that sits on top of Vumi. Because Vumi says, let's make. So, th yeah, okay, fair enough. So, three years ago, um, we started thinking, what do we want to do? That, like, what, what big problem do we want to solve? And then we started thinking about uh, let's build a, a big ass messaging platform that makes all of these big problems go away and low, seriously lowers the barrier to entry into the mobile space so that people, local developers, can, can solve local problems without breaking the bank. Um, now, three years ago, that seemed like a pretty big moonshot. But now I'm, we're hosting 300 lines of code that makes all of that possible. So for me, three years ago, Vumi was a moonshot. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that these examples that I've, been given, that I've given are necessarily moonshots. They would have been three years ago. Um, I, I'm mostly talking about